I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. Think out of the box. Surprise yourself. Do something. You know, you surprise yourself, you surprise everybody else. But you're right about Bart Simpson and the journey. I believe as an artist, you have to do the work and then throw it away. And then you have to just go in and be there in present time and just trust, trust that what I have done is going to serve me, serve me best. I mean, even when I went in for The Simpsons, I went in for Lisa and the audition pieces of Bart and Lisa were sitting right next to each other. Hers said eight-year-old middle child, his a 10-year-old, school-hating, underachiever, and proud of it. I'm like, oh, bam, bam, that's it. And that was that was my trusting my instincts. Because I believe that's true, really true for all of us. There was a book I read. Linda Oaks wrote this book called Hello, He Lied. And it was about writing and producing. She says, ride the horse in the direction that it's going. And I thought that was amazing. So, okay, I'm going in this direction, you know? That's incredible. You could do those sounds all day, and uh, I would just like, listen. (laughs) You may, actually, you probably have heard of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. I call them choose-yourself currencies because they don't depend on any institutions to function, and they're simply exploding in price right now. Some have jumped as high as 3,000%. 21,000 percent and even a rare 81,000 percent if you're missing out on this boom don't worry you're not alone most people are not investing in crypto simply because they don't even know how to get started so i decided to do something about that i want to help listeners like you get started in this booming market so i'm offering a free six video series masterclass on cryptocurrencies all for free I'll walk you step-by-step through the entire process. If you're interested in claiming this free masterclass, please go to altature.io. That's altature.io slash masterclass, where you'll find all of the details. We are going to have fun. (laughs) Oh, we're starting with that. We have an hour? We have an hour and a half? Whatever, Whatever you want. Well, I may not be... That was kind of off the record there, but I'm not going to be promoting. I don't need to have people throwing rocks at me, you know? No, no, no. We're, we're going to start with we're going to have fun. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so I've got Nancy Cartwright with me, the most unknown famous person in the world. Would you say that's accurate, Nancy? That's pretty good. I Yeah. Like if you were walking down the street, does anyone ever say, oh, Nancy Cartwright? The only time they do that is if I've gone to like a small town, like a university town, Ohio University or whatever, and they know that I'm going to be there, Ah. then I will get recognized a few times because my face is, you know, posted all over the place. But 
you know, here we are in the middle of Manhattan. Nobody knows me from Adam, you know? We're going to dive into the topic I want to talk about most in a second. I'll, I'll leave the <laughs> reveal for another minute. But you have to, I'm I'm sorry to ask this. You, you have to actually ex, s, s, sort of demonstrate why you're the most famous person in the world that's unrecognizable. James, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> I have no idea why I am here. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we? What is Manhattan? Very good. So you're the voice of Bart Simpson and many other <laughs> voices. Would you like so if if you're ever having like a problem at the airport, do you just start doing Bart Simpson and they let you through? <laughs> I you know, I have tried that before. I have done that. I was on a flight once to uh to the UK. This is way back, this is in two thousand. This is before nine one one. And I, I was actually the um, flight attendant. Recon she recognized, <clears throat> excuse me, recognized me because of my seating and my arrangement. And she's, she's like, "Are you the Nancy Cartwright?" And I said, "Guilty as charged, ma'am." <laughs> and it was, it was kind of quiet. I mean, they were getting set up. It's loud on an uh -huh. airplane. I was sitting in the aisle. She was just like beyond herself. She was so excited, and she said. You know, perhaps maybe at, at some point in time, would you ever be willing to, because both we've got co-pilots are huge fans of The Simpsons, would you be willing to come up into the cockpit and maybe say a few things on the PA to the passengers? And I was like, to me, I thought that was amazing. That sounded like so That's much fun. That's the coolest fun. role in the world. Oh, my gosh, that was so cool. But I didn't want to act too excited. And I said, yeah, we could probably arrange something like that. So brilliant, brilliant. So towards the end of the flight, I'll come back. You rest and, have, you know, enjoy your flight. Can I get you something to drink? You know, that kind of a thing. So towards the end of the flight, they came back and got me and brought me up into the cockpit. And I'm getting the tour of the whole place and all the buttons and knobs and bobbles and everything up there. And... It was evening, so it was like gorgeous flying into Heathrow, and just so they put me on. <laughs> they put me on and say, uh, "Ladies and gentlemen, this is Bart Simpson. Your captain is speaking. I, I just want to let you know that actually both of your co-pilots have been drinking too much. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna, <laughs> we're gonna actually gonna be landing in in uh, in Tokyo in about five minutes." <laughs> Did anyone actually take it seriously? Well, like, I don't. You know, I couldn't hear them complaint? outside, <laughs> and they kept me up in the. They kept me up in the cockpit until the whole plane had disembarked. So I was um, pretty safe. But they were enjoying the show. I, I thought it was kind of fun. That's fun. So we're gonna kind of get to the arc of your career, which, of course, you know, The Simpsons uh, is about to enter season twenty nine, and uh, yeah. uh, I mean, it's an, an incredible career. But what's really incredible is that while people think of you, I, I think the average person who knows you probably thinks, okay, this is the voice of Bart Simpson. You've really embarked on so many different creative endeavors, and your most recent one is a beautiful, beautiful movie that uh, you you wrote along with your writing partner, um, In Search of Fellini, which is about your personal search for Fellini, or roughly, I'm not going to say it's about, I want to actually be respectful to uh, Fellini's quote that all autobiography is is art, or all art is autobiography. So, but but it somewhat reflects your own quest in your twenties for Fellini, a, a trip you took to Italy, right in the middle of your own career. Um, but before you were doing The Simpsons, but after you had already started on a on a, the beginnings of a successful career as as both an actress and a, a voiceover uh, star. And uh, what you know, there was a quote in the movie. Thank you for that, by the way. I just, I appreciate it so much. You know, you've done so much homework on it, and I've done so many interviews, and it's refreshing to have somebody that's really, you know, knowledgeable in what we're dealing with here. It's a, it's, it's a, I'm just, I'm really touched. I am. Well, well you know, it's interesting because Fellini himself is such an inspiration, and you take so many elements of not his biography, but his views as an artist and put it in the movie. And that in turn reflects your own uh, artistic career. And and I wanna I wanna get to that, but there's um first off, I, there's this one Fellini quote which reminds me of this movie. And I wonder if you've thought about it, which is it, I, I'll try to remember it correctly, but um um the 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 pearl is the autobiography of the oyster. Yeah. And I feel that way about this movie. Oh wow. Wow, that's lovely. And 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 in, in the movie, I'll just uh, there's one more there's one quote in the movie that really stuck out for me, and maybe it's like two thirds of the way through, which is um, um, 
you know, sometimes you have to travel mm-hmm. far, far away to get to In what's to closest to you. In order to find what is you. closest to you, yeah. Yes. So yeah. maybe start with that quote. Like, what does that mean to you and, and how it reflected in the movie? And I, and I think, it, wow. was that a Fellini quote also? or You know what? Ironically, it's not. Because um, it feels like a Fellini quote. Wow, it's awesome. Um, no, that was when I landed. Because it, it, to give you just one little thing is that this is about, this film is probably about 75 to 80% true. Because at the beginning of the film, it says, based on a true adventure, and then the word mostly pops in there. So it's mostly true, but there's the the homage to Fellini. I mean, obviously, there's what Teron Lexton did to contribute to this film is extraordinary. And his, understand, his understanding of the body of work that Fellini did is much more than mine. And Peter's, to be to be honest with you, it's like he added that whole element to it. But that quote came when I, when I decided to make this trip and, and go to find Fellini. I was in my 20s, and I was in an acting class. This is like what you had said a couple years before I was cast as Bard. And it was 1985, and I was studying Fellini's La Strada in my acting class and putting up every scene and just got to a point where— What do you mean putting up every scene? Yeah, it was an acting class, and it was a scene study class. So you take you take a movie, and there, you, there might be one scene that you want to then take that scene and put it on the stage. You know, you and a partner or several partners will perform this and, and get a critique from the teacher in terms of training as an actor. So I took lots of scenes from La Strada because I just— there was something about that movie. My teacher told me, take a look at this film and tell me what you think. And when I saw Julietta's performance in it, Julietta Messina, I just, this little innocent clown who was, you know, bought by this beast of a man who literally was the strong man in a traveling circus. And she was this little innocent clown that all she did was she entertained, put white face on, super cute. The audience loved her. And throughout the film, you see her demise is that he just was a beast to her and just beat her down eventually to her death. And at the end, I mean, it's, it, Fellini's films are so tragic anyway. They're, they're so symbolic and a little weird and a little strange. And I saw other films, and they didn't, they didn't quite have the same impact on me than that La Strada did. So that's why La Strada, you follow? So, so well, well, let me ask you about that, because Fellini, um, one of his inspirations for La Strada was this story of a friend of his told him where, you know, the, he, there was a, a you know, it was, it was difficult to travel on the roads at that time from Rome to the north. And he saw this, um, uh, like, cart, this tarpaulin-covered cart uh, being pulled by kind of a, a strong man or a stronger person. But then in the back yeah. was a smaller woman pushing, and it kind of signified the, the hard life that this woman yeah. had. And that somehow inspired him to put it into this circus context, and, he, and that was the woman. Yeah, so it's incredible. And he cast his wife for the role. That's right. And how, how perfect was that? How perfect was that? And the two of them, because he was large. He was like 6'4", I think, and she was teeny. She was like, I think, 5'2", still pretty petite compared to him, or 5'3". But but she um, was coming from, even when she met Fellini, from, from an acting career. Yeah. Just like you, you know, before you went on this search, this quest, you were already in in movies. You That's were right. already doing voiceovers. You did. You were Gloria and Richie Rich. You were in the Twilight Zone. You had already <laughs> done all these things. You had you had had at least two significant mentors in your Don't life. Don't forget Mr. Belvedere. I didn't and know Cheers. Mr. Belvedere. Oh, yeah. Oh, Come okay, on. Okay, wait. Can we go to Cheers for a second? Because... Cheers was a remarkable story. You audition. Oh my and God, you, James! <laughs> no, let, let me tell the story. How do you know all this? You audition, and then you were just supposed to walk off the set. <laughs> but you have this urge to kind of—I think you have this urge to infuse an extra bit of art into everything you do. You not only walk off the set, you not either the stage. You just walked home. I did. I did because the last line in on the in the script in the audition Carla who's Rio Perlman turns to me and says I like your choker referring to a necklace around my which I didn't have on and I look at her and as written I say I'm not wearing a choker she goes oh you will be and I I turn I say well goodbye and I turn 
And you're right. I just walked out of the casting office and I just kept, I just went home. Was that a riff in the sense that you just decided right then you were going to just keep on walking? <laughs> well, this is something that Milton actually, I got to credit him for doing that. Milton Katselis, a great acting teacher. Yeah. Uh, some of my favorite actors studied under him, uh, uh, Gene Hackman, Alec Baldwin, Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, Doris George Roberts. Clooney. Yeah, so, exactly, exactly. And an incredible teacher that you had mentored yourself to who encouraged you to to see Los You know, Strata. he says, think out of the box. Surprise yourself. Do something, you know, do because you surprise yourself, you surprise everybody else. Huh. And so I just thought, I, I, it was very, it was very um, on, at spur of the moment. It was, I had not decided to do that. And I just said to myself, you know, I'm out of here. I say the F-bomb right there. <laughs> I don't know if we can By the way, you're allowed to say this podcast is where the Wild West is. Okay, I said, media. fuck it, man, I'm out of here. And so I just walked out the door and I kept going. And I mean, that creates an effect because they're thinking I'm going to come back in. And obviously, by the time they realize I'm gone, I'm already way, I'm in my car. And I drove, I actually went right home and the, literally the phone was ringing and it was my agent. Nancy, you totally walked out. They love you. They want you. You got the job. <laughs> oh my because- God. Because, and you just said two things there that are very interesting to me, and it, and it applies to everything else. Uh, when you surprise yourself, you're going to surprise everyone else. Yeah. So I think that's that's kind of, that's so interesting. Like that's, you could apply that to almost every area of life for, for yeah. success. But but the other thing is- Your uh, instincts are correct. Yeah, yeah and, you, and you, you, you created an effect, and that's, they have to talk about you after that. <laughs> and so the casting director has everybody has to talk about you a little bit more than they talk about everyone else. Yeah. And that we don't know if that's what got you the role, you know, as opposed to your pure acting skill, but I'm sure the, the just the psychological fact that they had to put more time into talking about you, you know, yeah. help them make their decision. It's so true. I mean, you, it, it's not something that if it's calculated and it looks like it's staged, it doesn't create that effect. To me, it really it has to be something that is so sincere and it has to be Really, it has to be honest. It it can't be something that you that's calculated. Like for example, a, another thing um, that's true, and it's not true because there are, there are capers that I've done. I have actually done capers. Some, yeah, little <laughs> capers that I find they're so fun, and sometimes it doesn't. It sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. I was off. This was uh, it was a, a movie of the week, a CBS movie of the week called Marion Rose White. And this was at the beginning when they first started doing um, tragedies of the week, television. That was what it was all about, something that was real, and it was a reenactment of that. And I was cast as the lead character. Valerie Perrine played my mother. Catherine Ross played this nurse. It took place in um, Sonoma, California, in a psych. There was a young woman, Marion, who there wasn't anything wrong with her. And I was, I'm really, I'm really pulling off track here. Anyway. No, the, that's okay. I'll, I'll bring it back. Trust, oh trust my me God, to always bring it back. Oh my God, this is so off track. But it was, it was a real story of this woman. And I never met Marion, although she was still alive, but they didn't want me to meet her. But I had been gone working with Jonathan Winters at Gambier, Kent, uh, Kent State, in Gambier, Ohio, at Kent University in Ohio. And Jonathan Winters had worked at WING Radio in Dayton, Ohio, where I grew up. And he had worked at the same radio station 30 years before I worked there. So I had this relationship. Jonathan didn't know about me, but I knew about him. Of course, he's a, such a great oh comic my God. actor and comedian. Yes, and this was the time in his career when he was on Mork and Mindy yeah. was kind of happening Mork's around that son. Time. That's right, his baby. <laughs> it was amazing. So I was off doing this thing with Jonathan Winters, and they were trying to cast this lead role in Marion Rose White. And Mayor Winningham was up for it, and Helen Hunt was up for it, and I was gone, so I wasn't there. But when I came back, they still hadn't found this part, so I got to go in for it. And Jonathan had given me this visor, and it looked like a lobster. It was made out of that polyfoam stuff. It was the most ridiculous. Nobody would ever wear this in public. But I heard that Marion, the character Marion, had a wild imagination. She also was blind as a bat. And that was her main problem is they thought she was mentally, they thought she was retarded. And her mother gave her up as a ward to the state. They believed in eugenics and they, you know, gave her a hysterectomy and put her on all kinds of drugs. There wasn't anything wrong with her. She was an angel. She loved children and her, she just couldn't see. And they gave her, her mother, something happened to her and she couldn't, well, she couldn't take care of her, refused to really commit to her own daughter and gave her over as a ward to the state and pretty much ruined her. So this is the part that 
that they were looking for. And I had never done anything of that magnitude. The responsibility that it took to do that part was enormous. I had no idea what I was entering into. But I sat in the, in the lobby waiting for the audition, and I'm the only one there. They'd already seen hundreds and hundreds of girls, and um, so I'm sitting there, and I have on this lobster hat and these glasses, and I'm trying to read the script, and I've got it pulled up to my eyes, <laughs> one inch away from my eyes, seeing, can I read this, or is this ridiculous? And I'd done this at home, but I was just sort of kind of going through the motions again before I went in. And at the last second, I, I, I kind of, I flinched. I decided not to do it. And I took the glasses off, and I put the hat, and I sat them aside, and then they called me. And I went in, and I met Gerald Abrams, who is J.J. Abrams' dad, Oh, you're kidding. J.J. was like nine at the time, okay? I was tw in my early 20s. And, and you started dating. Well, <laughs> I started being J.J.'s babysitter. I mean, it worked out so great. No, no, I didn't. I, I met J.J. actually. At, his dad threw a rap party. But I went in there and read for it, and the next day I found out that I got the part. But they told me, and this is a point of this long story here, they told me that what really got me the part was sitting in the lobby, and with the lobster hat on and those glasses, they saw that I was already auditioning. So that's, that's the cue to actors that are listening to this, that you are on the second you get in your car and you're driving over there. Again, it's it's not just actors. It's, I think it's it's anything in life. You have to you have to learn to be as authentic as possible. And I think in in your movie, it's really this this girl's quest to to finding her authentic artistic self, just like it was yeah. for you in the in the eighties when you were when you were on your search for Fellini. But it reminds me, actually, you say this is off tangent, but it reminds me of Lucy in the beginning of this movie. Lucy's the main character, mm -hmm. and Lucy is off for a job. Yep. And she wears this these offbeat glasses. That's right. And was that were you thinking of that when you were uh, writing that part that uh, scene? Well, to answer that, Peter Chenis and I went in writing this. It took us. It took us like, well, it was about 20 years from the time it was done as a one. I know this is kind of chopped up. It's okay. Um, it's a bit it's a bit chopped up, but um, it was. That's, life is chopped up. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. And this so, this movie is about your life, so. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to be of. bouncing back and forth. But, but we did 20, like, no, a dozen versions of it. So we were just talking about it on the way over here today. And I had seen, last night I had seen um, Dear Evan Hansen. First time, and I had seen it. And I said to P Peter, didn't see it. Um, I went by myself, and here I am watching it, and I'm realizing, OMG, this, oh my fucking God, Evan Hansen, the theme of that film is very much like one of the versions that we did of In Search of Fellini. It was so much of it because one of the versions was Lucy was going off, and she creates, she, she creates a lie. And it's, it's, she doesn't see it as a lie. She's trying to fix something, and it's a diversion. And by the end of the film, she has created such an aesthetic. It's different than Evan Hansen that it's not a, how do I say this? Um, you see the journey that she has taken, and she has, has sent these postcards home to her mother. And she has changed not only her mother's life, but... The whole town has gotten involved with it. I don't want to go too much there because, yeah, yeah. because, sure. but, but people should I, see the movie. It was astounding, though. I said, Peter, you have to see this. It was so much like one of. It was like version number two and version number twelve. It was incredible. But my point is, we hand we picked a lot of different parts from different versions that we did, and we didn't limit ourselves to that. It was just kind of there was so much of an evolution in creating this pro this prop product that you will see when you go to the theaters. It was such an evolution that I can't really say that it was just, you know, it wasn't one script. It was a lot of contribution. Well, well, uh, it, it really, it didn't strike me until you said it just now, like that, and, and, and without going too much into the details of every scene, she was living, even though she, she seemed authentically original to herself. Yeah. She was, and, and she was also helpless in some ways, kind of like the the character you mentioned in the movie, the the, the actual role you played in that earlier movie. It was, it's almost oh. like you 
you translate yeah. into that this character a little bit. But you said she had to tell a lie. Um, mm-hmm. She was not quite living in her her authentic self, so that's why she had to travel. Yeah, yeah, she had to get out of the the rut of her normal routine, and somehow in order to find her artistic self. Yeah, and I think she learns about art all along the way. <laughs> I and, love that. And, and and for you, let's let's look at your career. You knew where your talents were. Like you were already a successful voiceover artist. You were you were an actress. Um, you had mentored under uh, Daw- Dawes Butler, who had yeah. done Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear and all these other you know great you know amazing animated characters. And then you you know you you started taking you know acting classes with a, with a great teacher. So you understood the role of mentorship mm-hmm. and and how that propels success. What led you? To, from going from just performing, you know, La Strada on a mm-hmm. stage to actually saying, oh, I'm going to go yeah. in, the, in the mid-80s to Italy and find Fellini. Yeah, that's great. This kind of goes back to where I originally pulled us way off tr- what I thought was off track. It wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't. It's it's beautiful. No, I'll tell you what it was. is like when I moved to Los Angeles, and you'll see, you'll when you see the film, you'll sort of see that that was my kind of like what Lucy does, is taking off to find, she's like in search of something. And I'm sort of like in search of my dream, except that I knew what's different from me and Lucy Cunningham in the film is that I certainly did not lead a sheltered life. I'm one of six kids, and I was an actress, and I mostly competed in um, contest speech, like doing, not not debate. I didn't want to be a politician or a lawyer or anything. I mean, I did individual events, which was like after dinner speaking, um, which is stand up. I did a little bit of that and just um, prose and poetry reading, but focused really on storytelling and humorous interpretation of literature. James Thurber was a, I was a huge fan, am still a huge fan of James Thurber, 13 Clocks and Many Moons, these children's stories. And nobody taught me, including Dawes Butler, how to do voices. I had no idea that I could do this. I, I like to make people laugh as a kid, not so much like a class clown, would be I wasn't so much of a troublemaker, although there were times when I remember like with my it was I guess geography teacher, Mr. Dworkin, I would I would do like <laughs> dripping. I go, How do you do that? It's just a you know, you pluck your cheek, you kinda of hit the top of your head and make it. He would he, it, 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 like the class was totally giggling because they knew that it was me. It drove him nuts. Well, did he think like something was leaking? Yeah, like he thought he, he just couldn't figure out where it was coming from. So, so even w- with, so so there's a little bit of Bart Simpson in oh, you from even yes, as, uh, guilty, as a child. so bad. Yeah, I had done some stupid stuff. I wrote, God, I don't want to say his name, but... Um, yeah, I say wrote Jim Holly and fucks Patty Reese because I I really I had such a crush on this guy and he, that was his girlfriend and I was so jealous and I wrote it in magic marker in the bathroom and you know I just did it I didn't think I was destroying pop property it never occurred to me that I was really I thought so you know it'll wash off it was a permanent marker okay oh, and no. by the end of the day I'm called down to the principal's office and busted. But the way the it was the vice principal, and he sat me down. He says, "I understand you're quite an artist." You know what I said? It didn't occur to me I was getting. I was like, "Oh, <laughs> thank you." <laughs> I took it as a compliment. Oh my God, Nancy, wake up! He says, "No, I saw that artwork that you did in the bathroom," and all of a sudden, like, oh, the penny dropped. I'm like, "Oh man, I'm so in trouble." And your mom's on her way over here today, Nancy. You're gonna you're gonna be staying home tomorrow. That's really that's not how that's not how we behave here. You know that's not okay. And um, yeah, I was pretty humiliated. Not so. I'll tell you, I was not humiliated because of what I had done. I was more hu- humiliated because my mom now knows I know the f word. <laughs> that's what did it. So. There is a little bit of. And Bart. obviously, it had impact that you remember it like all these years later. Oh so. my god. Yeah, it was humiliating. Hasn't stopped you from saying the F word, but uh, <laughs> but you clearly know, no. But you're right about Bart Simpson and and the journey. But you know, also like so, you just made this kind of water plopping sound. You know mm-hmm. that you were obviously able to do as a kid. You were doing, you were already doing voiceover work, and you were successful at it. What made you then realize, oh, I'm gonna, I. You were humble enough to also say, okay, I need further mentorship. Yeah. And that's when you reached out to maybe the most successful voiceover <laughs> artist at that time. You know, somebody had come into to WING Radio, where Jonathan Winters had worked there years ago. 
And here I am just kind of filling in for people that go on vacation. I learned everything from reception to accounting to the traffic department where you get to schedule the commercials in. And when I'm listening to these commercials and I'm doing this, I got to see the name of the advertising agency. And there are all these actors' names in there like Joni Gerber and um, who else's his name? Uh, Frank Welker. And I saw these guys' names and I recognized them from cartoons. And here I am, I've been competing in speech and getting big trophies, like first place in humorous interpretation. And um, I'm going, wow. And I would get comments from the judges, you have a unique voice. You should do cartoons for a living. Well, this is Kettering, Ohio. I mean, it's not exactly the animation capital of the world, right? So I'm like, how do I do that? So some woman came in promoting music, and she was from Warner Brothers. And that, to me, meant Mel Blanc. And my boss, he was wonderful. My boss, Jim, Jim, um, Jim, oh no, I went blank. Jim Barnett, Jim Bennett, Jim Bennett. He knew that. So he introduced me to this woman from Warner Brothers. And she was like, yeah, you put a little something together for me and I can pass it along. And I didn't know what a demo tape was and it should be about two minutes long. And I put a tape together on my own, 13, 14 minutes long, sent it to her, and she was awesome. She wrote me back, and she sent me Dawes Butler's name. He was one of many names and phone numbers, addresses or whatever. So I called him, and that started our relationship. He called me back, and boom, I but was would, off. And, and when you were in L.A., then you spent hours. I mean, you, you, you must have... You were putting in your 10,000 hours studying under him when yeah. you were already had so much talent and skill as a, as a voiceover artist. Well, he, like what were some of the things you learned that were, took you that final, you know, that final stretch to be professional? Yeah, well, you were already professional, like, but but maybe you didn't view yourself yeah. that way. I don't know. No, I had never been paid. I had never been paid to do it before. I wasn't making a living doing that. I mean, it was working at this radio station, but and I did a little thing in the afternoon as a promo for the station. It just was a little bit in the afternoon that I lived for that five minutes with the weather guy and the traffic guy, you know, and doing a little character which was similar to Bart, you know, mm -hmm. it was a girl, lily pad. But, but it took Dawes, Dawes, I worked with Dawes, and it took a couple years before he felt like I was ready to really put another tape together. And he, Wow, a couple of years. Yeah. Like if you had been told that at the beginning of those years, would you have said, I'm not waiting a couple of years? <laughs> no, because this was a guy that was like such a pioneer, Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear, Quick Drum Girl, Elroy Jetson, Bob Louie, Coswell Cog, Peter oh, Potter. Like, oh my gosh, the Raisin Brand Sun, uh, just like Captain Crunch, amazing Pixie. No, he was Dixie, not Pixie. He was Dixie. Um, Bob Louie, he just did Peter Potamus. I mean, he did so many of these characters that, that I grew up on, and, and maybe you too. But it's like, Wow, this guy and I would go to his house on Sundays, catch the 86 bus from Westwood and go into Beverly Hills, walk a couple blocks for an hour lesson. I was there four hours. And he and his wife, who's now 100 years old, Murtis is 100 <laughs> years old now, still around. Bless her heart. She's like amazing. And um, they would take me out to dinner and drive me back to UCLA to my dorm. And I just, no, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know this industry. I was living kind of like under a dome at UCLA and completely protected on a play field and started doing theater. And that kind of segued me into doing sta more stage where I ended up doing a play. I was 22 playing a 12-year-old, doing a very controversial play that got me a lot of attention. And from that, I got an agent. And that's how I started balancing like on camera, fairly quickly, I think I, um, doing on camera stuff with, yeah, start and, and doing, um, uh, Richie Rich was the first thing. That was in the spring of 81. And in the spring of 81, that's when I got an agent and did a pilot and Twilight and all that stuff started rolling out. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I doing? What am I doing? I thought I was just going to be voiceovers and now I'm juggling... At that age, going out, I'm doing two careers because it really was two careers. But the on-camera stuff wasn't part of the plan. I didn't plan on doing that. It kind of happened. But there was a book I read. Linda Opst wrote this book called Hello, He Lied. And it was about writing and producing. And it was an awesome book. It was written a number of years ago. But she says... Oh, the title. 
was a great title, but ride the horse in the direction that it's going. And I thought that was amazing. So, okay, I'm going in this direction, you know? <laughs> That's incredible. You so, could do those. I you could do those sounds like all day, and uh, I would just like listen. <laughs> but you know, don't anything. It's 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 a carpe diem kind of viewpoint. You got to seize the moment when it's happening to you. But but it's also like it's a certain kind of commitment to to the moment. You know, just like what you did with the Cheers audition, walking off. You yeah. have to really commit to it. And and if it feels fake or scripted, it doesn't work. You have to commit to to to. Even the voices, you have to really say, I'm going to do this and, yeah. and not waver, not have my voice waver at all. Yeah. Yeah, I think when you make a decision, when you make a strong decision like that, you back it 100%. You don't waver. You know, we all have like these, you know, it's so easy to fall into little um, voices, that you know, negativity that can come into your your world, your universe. Like you're, for an, for an artist, it would be, you're too young. You're too old. You're too fat. You're not. You're not tall enough. No one's you're gonna like, like this. Yeah, it's like, or you know, God, she's so much better than me. And even sitting mm. in the wait in in the audition room, waiting to go in, you're sitting in there with all these other artists, and you're these are the people that are competing for the same part. It's a very strange method. It seems it's the one that Hollywood chooses to do that audition process. It's so difficult. So if you, the way to the way to win, if you will, the way to be causative as an artist is to not think of it as a competition, but make your decision for what you're going to do at that audition and fulfill the decisions that you've made. And then you cannot lose. So what do you mean? So for instance, in the in the movie you described um, where you, you, you took off the glasses and yeah. hat, you didn't quite, you had you made a decision earlier, but you didn't quite commit to it um, going into the audition. Yeah, because I didn't think that I was... That wasn't part of my audition. Hmm. The audition was actually the character and the reading of the part. It was the decision that I made in terms of the emotional investment and how am I going to play this scene. So I kind of broke the scene down and where is she going and how do I need to start and, you know, is there a, an arc in the scene, things like technical things that an actor would do. But I never considered that I brought the hat along maybe to show them the hat, hmm. but I, I didn't make the decision I, I don't know. It's like wearing the hat. Okay, I'm not going to walk in. Maybe I'll bring it. And at the last second, I'm going. No, I'm just going to go in and, and do that. But still, it was good. it was enough of a commitment that they saw you in the waiting. In I the guess waiting so. Area. I so, guess so. So how do people practice this idea of surprise? You or how do people learn to do that to surprise yourself so you could surprise everyone? That's a great question. Like clearly, you kept yeah. practicing that. You you consciously thought this is a pathway to success. In addition to all the skills you were developing at the yeah. same time. You know, it seems like there was there was mentorship was a key part of your success. There mm -hmm. was innate talent. There was, uh, and then there's this element of both surprise and um, and commitment and immersion. You know, I think that I don't know that you can really actually define more than what you just said about it. It's just like I believe as an artist, you have to do the work and then throw it away, and then you have to just go in and be there in present time. And just trust, trust that mm. what I have done is that's going to serve me, serve me best. I mean, even when I went in for The Simpsons, I went in for Lisa. And the audition pieces of Bart and Lisa were sitting right next to each other. And here's my part. Okay, here's the monologue. I never, I, I wasn't sent it ahead of time. I'm looking at it and reading it. It's you know, cute. It's fine. There's a picture of her. Wow, that's an interesting looking animated character that I'd never seen before. Most animated up to that point in time was the Jetsons, the Flintstones. They're very real looking, even though cavemen, the Flintstones, but they look like people. You know, but right. you see the Simpsons and they got weird hair and they kind of did, but pudgy and yellow. And it's like odd. But Bart was right next to it. And I picked her said eight year old middle child, his a 10 year old school hating underachiever and proud of it. I'm like, oh, bam, bam, that's it. <laughs> and that was that was my trusting my instincts because I believe that's true, really true for all of us. And if you can just believe that, that you are correct, your instincts are correct. But know, how do you, how do, I mean, maybe you, again, this was at a point already after your 
uh, your your search for Fellini, which which will well, I I, I want to make the connection actually between uh, your search for in search of Fellini the movie, yeah. and The Simpsons. Yeah. But 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 uh, how do you? Maybe you only build those instincts and those that faith in those instincts after much experience. I I don't know. You know, I think that's that's planet Earth, and that's like, you know, gee whiz. I think that you know we all have we all have baggage with us, and we're trying to like we're all trying to survive. You know, it has to do with survival. And as an artist, there's a for me anyway, and and I think actually for all artists, there's a little bit more to it because there's a responsibility level that goes with being an artist because the world, the in terms of a culture, the culture looks, people, individuals look towards the artists because it's through art. It's an aesthetic wavelength. I don't know how else to describe it, but there's an aesthetic band that, that when you go to the movies, or when you see something phenomenal on stage, you see dancers or you hear a piece of music that makes you cry and you don't know why. It's because that wavelength, it just laser sharp goes into your very beingness, the soul of who you are. And it just, it can change you. It can lift you up. It can like pull you out of the, I sw- it, this is my viewpoint, I swear. It like pulls you out of this physical universe into an area where it's it's just beautiful and that's what makes you cry let's stop to take a quick break we'll be right back today's show is brought to you by one of my all-time favorite companies i cannot recommend this company enough audible audible has the best audiobook performances an unmatched selection and the most exclusive content. The quality is great, it's easy to use, and the functionality is easy. And so although I really enjoy actual reading, listening is a more immersive and theatrical experience. Take this example. If you were listening to Starship Troopers by Robert Heinlein, you'd experience things like the hair raising on the back of your neck or a shiver down your spine. Because with audible sci-fi performance so powerful, you can feel transported to another dimension even while sitting in traffic. Start a 30-day trial, and your first Audible book is free. Learn more at audible.com slash James. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash J-A-M-E-S if you didn't already know how to spell my name. So when you were studying La Strada, obviously, yeah. like, like it's interesting what you say about wavelength because... Obviously, uh, uh, there's always, everybody kind of, the universal consensus is that Fellini is one of the most brilliant filmmakers of all time. Yeah. But a lot of people will just sit there and watch his movie in today's fast-paced, uh, movies yeah. in today's fast-paced world and say, uh, I don't get it. Yeah. Because he had this uh, uh, absurdist, uh, surreal kind yeah. of viewpoint as well. And But some people will look at it and say, oh my gosh, I connect so much to what he's saying. Obviously, that happened to you with La Strada. Yeah. And... Uh, in the middle of all these cartoons. Yeah, you were already and doing again, cartoons, like, right? Yeah. So you're right, and that's exactly what it was. There was something about that film that just went right into me, and I said, I need to do something with this, and I don't know what. So I started to put up every scene and cast different Zompanos, different um, fools. Richard Basehart plays right. the fool and played every part. M- Milton says, "What are you? What, what are you doing?" You know, I said, you're doing another scene. What's, what What do you want to do, Nancy? I said, I don't know. I think, I don't know. And then I said, I'm still looking at it. And then one day I realized, I said, you know what I want to do? I want to get the rights to do La Strada as a stage production. So that was my impetus for going to Italy. And I didn't, they served me quite at, this is the one thing that I got out of ICM that uh, because I was a car- cartoonist, I wasn't really, Holly Hunter was represented by ICM, and she was well on her way. We were kind of the same, about the same age. So it's like, wow, she's getting a lot of attention. Um, they know that I do dripping faucets, and you know, I can do motorboats and cement mixers. I can do all these sound effects, but how do I fit into their world? And I was making my own way because I loved my agent. I really loved my agent. And anyway, but the head of the agency, Jeff Berg, 
he had, they, they represented Fellini. So I got Fellini's address. So I started writing letters to Fellini and I got no response. One letter after another, you know, all these letters that I wrote in one day, bam, I couldn't believe it. I got a letter back. Now they were not encouraging. They said, don't come. He's going to be here, but don't come. He's editing. He's going to be working. Cause I said, I'm going to be there around Christmas time. And I was like, no, no, no. But James, are you kidding me? He's going to be there. I'm like, I'm out of here. I am definitely going. So that's that thing. That's that passion. That's that art. Um, that's I don't know how to describe it more than that, but it's like, trust your instincts. I said, I'm out of here. I'm going. And trust your instincts about this one. It's not like you were... That I can meet this great director yeah. who did this film that like really, it, 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 it affected me in a way as a, as um, spiritually, if you will. It just moved me. I go, how did he do that? Maybe if he meets me, He'll give me the rights to La Strada, and I can do it on stage, and I can share this passion with other people. So that was kind of, that was the idea behind it. So I go off, but I I was going to go with a friend, and she got a call back. <laughs> it's so typical. She got a call back, and it's great. So I had to. I ended up going by myself. I wasn't going to let that stop me. So I take off, and I. But I, ahead of time, I'm looking at going, okay, he's going to be there at Christmas, but I got to take in the culture of Italy. I want to see, I want to eat, drink. I want to fall in love. I want to see what Italy is like, you know. I'll so again, this immersion, it's not like you're just making an appointment with no, Fellini no, no. and then coming back. It's this, it's this commitment to doing something a little surprising because yeah. he doesn't know you're showing up. No. Probably your agents think you're crazy. Probably <laughs> Milan and Casellas thought you were crazy for all I know. I, I don't know. But, but my friends were a little bit like, God, Oh my God, it, because I, I, I could do that. A lot of people were married and I didn't have, I wasn't, I was single. I, I didn't have any obligations, so I could do it. And I was making a living with voiceovers. Also, a lot of people in my class were, were working, but not, you know, they had other jobs that they had. They were waiting tables. They were driving taxis, whatever they were doing, but I was making a living doing it. But it was working out fine in Christmas. It, 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 about Thanksgiving, the industry pretty much shuts down till the middle of January. It really is, there's not a lot happening. So I just said, well, whatever. I mean, this is part of my life. I'm gonna experience some life here. And what, what better training ground than mm. going out and investing my time in meeting people and kind of finding out who other people are. And holy mackerel, here I am with like, kind of like in my mid-20s, single, I don't speak the language. That was challenging. My luggage went to Frankfurt, Germany, true story. And you'll find that out in the movie, but so many of the events. So you said, was it this guy, that line? Okay, it goes back to... Um, the, you have to the, travel far, far sometimes away. Sometimes you have to travel far, far away in order to find out what is closest to you. So here I am, no luggage, and I'm stuck in Milan. And I was only going to be in Milan for... Um, for like a day and then take a train and go to Verona because I had mapped it out. I want to go to Milan, Verona, um, Venice, Florence, Pisa, Rome. And I'll make it to Rome within like, a, you know, almost two weeks, like 12 days or something like that. So here I am and I'm stuck and waiting for the airport to call me and I don't know where my luggage is. So I'm kind of waiting around and I go to this park and there's a, there's this guy on the park bench like maybe he was he was dressed in a like a Sergeant Pepper uniform, sounded like Mickey Mouse, only had four teeth, and he's sitting at one end and I'm at the other and he's feeding the birds. And you know, when you travel to Europe, it's like they almost give you a passport when you go to a foreign country to not be yourself. You start doing things and man, I took full advantage as an artist to to do that. And I started chatting with this guy. James, you won't believe what I pulled in. I can't believe who he was. His name was Cosmo, and he he had been an actor. He said, you won't recognize me because I got these clothes on, but I was, oh, he, he asked what I was doing, and I said, I'm going to find Fellini. Ah, oh, Fellini, ah, oh, Fellini, this is Fellini. I work with Fellini. Uh, you won't recognize me because I, I have my clothes on. I was in Satyricon. I was in Satyricon. I was an actor. I did this film, Chula. It's such a long title that by the time you get to the end, you forget what you said at the beginning. <laughs> I had worked at the actor's studio, but um, William Holden took all of my parts. I could not get any work. I had to come home again. This is the guy that I'm talking to. So I had somebody... She just randomly... Randomly guy, ran into this guy. And he guy. had been in Satyricon. That's ridiculous. And 
That is. That's and, and like I, crazy. I didn't know. So, so there is a scene kind of like that in the yeah. movie. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know that was autobiographical. And you actually played That's right. the uh, the wife of that yeah. character who had also had been in, in. But he said that line to me and I wrote it down. It came from this homeless, toothless, Mickey Mouse-like guy that spoke five, seven languages, something like that. And he sat there and showed me, and this was an artist that had been broken down bit by bit, couldn't get work anywhere. And now he's in his 70s. And he, I was just like so uh, touched by that. And I mean, that's going to stick in my personal portfolio in my mind, if you will, but but got this photo of him and me. And then I, you know, shook his hand. I ate some of the bread myself and moved on. And then ended up going and went to Verona. And there was an incident there that's in the film. I don't want to give it all the way, yeah, but yeah. The, the falling in love happened the, in Venice, a, a, a scene in that scene in Venice where I took Cosmo from Milan, turned her into a woman. I... You know, we create. I had this. I wanted to. I wanted to be in the film, but originally I was going to be Claire. I wanted to be Claire, and I thought, "Oh my God!" But, oh, Maria Bello was great. Oh my God! Oh my God! But here's what happened: is I realized, well, in in this is in pre production, and nobody is going to tell me. Nobody's going to tell me no. They're just riding along with me until I finally wake up one day and I said, "You know what? I." had a thought last night, this is talking to Teron and to Peter, and I said, I'm not playing Claire. What's, what's going, I said, no, this is not, this is gonna, this is not gonna help, this won't help the movie, this, this will destroy the movie. I can't do it, because people are going to be stuck, like how we started this interview. People know it's Nancy Cartwright, and the positioning of, you know, 29 years of doing The Simpsons, they're gonna just watch, watch me, and their attention will be on, she doesn't sound like Bart. Or she sounds a little bit like Bart. Because I don't think I sound like this. I don't think I sound like this all the time. You know, this is, I'm 10. <laughs> Bart Simpson, who the hell are you? And, and, you know, I'm a grandmother. Okay, I am a grandmother, and I play the voice of Bart Simpson. But it's it'll still be distracting. You know what I mean? So that was it. That was the end of that. Maria Bello, bam, only other consideration. She was the, cho- that was the choice. It's like this actress has... The responsibility has the, um, uh, I mean, certainly has the chops to do it. And her last name is Bello. I mean, come on. She's perfect for the part. Yeah, no, she was great. And so was uh, Mary Lynn Rice Cub. Lovely. Uh, Yeah, she's so fun. I think in general, she's a very uh, comedic actor and funny. uh, I've I've loved her since the the Larry Sanders show. (laughs) She was so, I like her dry sense of humor, you mean? She's so amazing. She... Yes, she brought the levity to this film, this otherwise... It's a very serious role, too. Like, yeah. It's not necessarily a comic role, although no. she brings her comic element to it. No, but very dry. You know what she used to do? When we shot, we, we were two weeks in Cleveland. She would, before we went to Italy, she was, we were in Cleveland together. I didn't know that she was doing this. She didn't tell anybody. We kept a really standard schedule, and they, they could actually go home at night at a decent hour and, and be prepared for the next day. Mary Lynn would go out and go to the comedy store in Cleveland and do stand up. That's that. how devoted, how committed she is to her art. She's amazing and such a delight to be with. Just charming. We so so scored in the So 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 you were in I want to get back to you were in Italy. Yeah. You have these so obviously the, the Lucy the main character also has incidents in Verona and Venice. Yeah. Um and uh what happened to you in the in when, yeah. you, when you were on this? Now I quest? hope I just hope that people are listening to to your podcast here after they've seen the film because this is these will be a little well. Okay, well it's, let, it's, it's, it's we don't, kind we're not of getting insight, into not to, okay. we're not getting into the details because I think the the great thing about the movie is the the education of an artist, how you find yeah. your authentic self and connecting to that wavelength. And you're not saying the specifics of what happens in these in the film. cities, yeah. Well, I will tell you, it's like there were so many things that happened in real life that we, ju- I just, we just, Peter and I, I just, I kept a diary. I would never let anybody read my diary though. Just know that. So James, don't even ask. I'm nobody's <laughs> reading the diary. I, think I you're, can't. I think you're sort of. Did you just sort of kind of? Passive aggressively say everybody should read the diary. No, no, I'm not. Are it's gonna not going to be. No, 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 now? no. It's not going to be published. In fact, I got to maybe probably get burn it somehow. <laughs> but but I went through it and I highlight- think you're feeling an urge to publish this. No, diary. no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. No, but I will tell you this is like 
we decided to go to Italy and retrace my steps for um, for um, locations, kind of location scouting. But we didn't have a budget yet, and I really wasn't authorized by my business manager to go off and do that. And I said, okay, let's just say I'm going on vacation, and I'm taking two bodyguards with me, and I'm paying for their trip. That's that. I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing research for the film. I'm just going on vacation, and I'm going to Italy. Bye. So that's what we did. And we went back and went to all these locations, and because I had, I, I kept a, a um, relationships with well one particular guy that you'll find out in the movie. So that's all I'm going to say. Little little thing there. Um, but when I went to um, go through, I was looking through all my photographs and notes and letters to Fellini that I had kept. There was like I had kept it all in a in a like a scrapbook. And I'm going through, and I came across a business card, and the business card was to a guy named Bippi Petitucci, and he was the the proprietor of this little shop that you'll see in the film. It's, it's, it's the scene that I'm in, and it's his name, and I thought he would, I remember I was like in my 20s, and I remember he was probably in his 50s, so now he's probably in his 80s, if my, my estimation of his age was correct, so he's probably still alive. I wonder if he's still there. So I go on the internet and pull it up, and I couldn't believe it. His store, it's, it said it was still there. So I called the number, and it went, da, da, da. The number you dialed is no longer. So, okay, okay, so it's fine. I'll have to wait till I go on the trip in a couple of days to find out if he's there. So then that on the, but I flipped over the card, and on the back was a name, Kevin Coates. I went, and a phone number, and I went, holy shit, this is the artist. And when you see the film, the symbolism that you know how with the, the fool he gives her the stone and he talks about everyone has a purpose. So when this happened, after an incident for me really happened in Venice, I duck away. I was had been like pretty much accosted by an Italian guy. And I got away from him, did some dam real damage to his body. Boom, right knee. Running like a bat out of hell, thinking I'm in I don't know, a Fellini movie, but certainly Hitchcock movie, something. And I duck away into this little antiquarian, and I'm sweating, and it's winter, it's cold, but I'm so, like, I'm so upset, and I don't want anybody to know it. I'm so afraid, and I'm just hiding. I'm just hiding. And um, I duck in there, and I'm just looking around, and I find this little piece of is a sculpture, and it was a little naked bronze woman coming out of a piece of lapis stone, beautiful, and I'm looking at this, and again, here's that aesthetic wave band. And I'm looking at this piece. I almost got raped, man. And I'm looking at, man, that's, that's so Barton. <laughs> that's weird. Okay. Barton, after He's 29 with me. years. I, no, I'm still saying it. Well, just, I almost got raped, man. To, to, <laughs> just to be clear, your, your memoir written in 2000, Autobiography of a 10 year old boy. So yeah, you, yeah. you do recognize the, the overlap between your life and Bart's. But, yeah. but okay, so. Can't get away from it. So I'm looking at this piece. And it totally, like, it totally pulled me out of this. In it really helped me tremendously. And I meet this proprietor, Bippy, and he chats with me. And, you know, I, I, I really love it. And he says, do you want to you talk to the artist, the sculpture? And I said, yeah. So he gets him on the phone, and he was in London. So I talk to this guy for maybe a minute, and I tell him, you know, I think it's beautiful, and I hope we can work out an arrangement that I can buy this. I really want to buy Thank you so much, Miss Cartwright. It's such a pleasure meeting you, and maybe perhaps someday we'll meet. And I said, Kevin, you're, it's, it's so beautiful. Thank you so much. It was a really simple conversation, nothing more than that. Hang up the phone. We work out a deal. You know, I didn't really think I gave him almost every penny that I had to buy it. I don't have enough. And this is moments after being... Going through a, a yeah. frightening, yeah. you know, life-threatening yeah. experience. Yeah, within 10 minutes, it's like 10 minutes later. And uh, just wiping, he gets me water. He, I never, I didn't share with him what had happened. I just, you know, I d couldn't share that. And um, so I, I, I buy this piece. So now f flash forward to like 2015 and we're about ready to take off and I've got this business card with his name on there. And I'm thinking, what happened to Kevin Coates? Where is he today? So I go on the internet. God, love the internet. I mean, it's got so many great what things. What would we do without it? Oh, my God. So I go on there and I put his name in. You won't believe what this guy does. He is amazing. That's one of the first things that he had ever done was my piece that I bought from him. And I saw that, that there was a book. There were little videos. This guy is like a... 
Renaissance man. And I mean it literally. He has long white hair. His wife, too. She's lovely. He plays the harpsichord. She plays a harpsichord, mandolin. They play these, you know, Renaissance mu- musicians. And he deals with, um, he's an alchemist, mostly dealing with wax and with gold. And he creates his own, they're mostly can hold in your hand, but brooches. And he's been um, commissioned by dukes and duchesses. And his works have been in museums. And I'm like, oh my God. And I saw there was a book. And thank God for Amazon Prime, because like I order this book, it's just like a coffee tea. It's a big, it's a massive. It's like one inch thick of this guy's work. And I get it again, like the day before we're leaving. And I'm like, holy shit, are you kidding me? So it's incredible what happened. So I, I write the, there was no, how do I get in touch with Kevin Coates? Should I go on or do you want to ask another? I mean, I'm, this is like. No, no, no. I'm, I'm oh fascinated. Oh my God. Because you know why I'm fascinated by this? There's this almost like this improv like aspect where the yes and. It's like, yeah. do you want to, you know, the, the, the store owner says, do you want to talk to him? And you said, yes. I would probably be like, oh, so, no, you don't have to. Like, I, I'd feel shy. But you were just like, yes. Embrace and- the moment. Carpe diem. It's like, it, you're right. You're absolutely right. So. And, that, um, and that's related to the whole like, oh, let's just jump on a plane. And even though everyone <laughs> has said no, including Fellini, I'm going to find him. And mm-hmm. somehow he's going to give me the rights to his, one of his greatest movies. And I'm going to do a stage production of it. Like, it's it's yeah. this kind of, um. You know, the, the beginnings of every improv starts like that. That's so beautiful. I love that. I think, you know, if people were more a little bit like that, then they, they would just be trusting the moment, you so, know? So, so you got the book from Amazon Prime. Got the book, was blown away by it. There was no, I didn't know how to get in touch with him, but I just go to the back of the book and there was a, a website uh, for the publisher of the book. So I wrote to the publisher. It just very briefly wrote... It, it just, you know, I'm on it. I'm I'm on a quest. I had done this trip way back in 19, and just briefly described what I did. I said I really would love to get. Can you get in touch with Kevin Coates? Is there any way you could forward his, you know, my email to him? And I'll leave it up to him, you know, out, out of respect. She said absolutely. She she ended up writing me back for, within within a day. I heard back from the publisher, very kind, and sent me an email address. And it turned out that it was Kevin's wife who manages him, and her name's Nell. And so I wrote her a letter and told her about this phone call and buying his artwork. And I just mentioned it, and I said, you know, we're doing this film, and we're going to be shooting it in Italy, and I would love to, you know, someday I would love to meet Kevin and you. I think you're amazing. And P.S., by the way, I don't know if you've heard of this little show. You know, it's called The Simpsons, and I'm also the voice of Bart Simpson. But most fondly, Nancy Cartwright, and then my data. So I sent that off, and it's really interesting what happened because it didn't create the effect I thought it was going to create. I thought for sure that they would res- that I would get a response back. It took a long time, and she, you know, Kevin is a, he's quite a bit older than me. I think he's probably in his I think he's in his eighties, and. Um, so I didn't get, and so F- Simpsons probably meant nothing. I don't think that it meant anything to Nell or him. And the response was kind of curt. And I thought, wow, wow, that's interesting. Okay, okay, that's fine. We weren't used to that. Yeah, yeah, it was a little bit, wow, okay. So we went off anyway and did, and did the trip and did, you know, location scouting and had an incredible journey and actually didn't find anybody that had been there when I did it. And that's fine because... We were inspired, the three of us, Tehran, Peter, and I were so inspired by, re- invigorated in a new, brand new time. N- forget, you know, it's, I, I said I used little bits and pieces, but it, it started to evolve into something more than what Peter and I had been creating for 20 years. And that ended up being, geez, we sat down and in a week, we wrote the script in a week because there was so much previous all the 12 scripts and that journey added together, it culm- and, and adding to Ron's investment of the whole Fellini esque quality to the film, as you saw. Right. It just, it was so clear what we needed to do. So he's writing scenes, I'm writing scenes. You take Verona, I'm going to take Venice. You know, we're going to, and that's how we kind of work together as writers. It was so, so satisfying. 
So, and, and then to Ron coming in and saying, you got to come over. You got to see what I found. Look at this. Look at the journey of Lucy. It parallels exactly Fellini's movies. This is amazing. I'm telling you, it was so... I, I just, if every artist could have something like, I think everybody has a story. If every artist could tap into that part of them, some some aspect that they are maybe afraid to share, something that is so personal mm. that it would surprise not only you, but others about who you are. That, that's interesting because it's, it, it, it's, so Fellini has a quote. Fellini says, everybody has the potential to be an amazing artist. Yeah. And it's and it, and I, I think people get shut down to that because they get into the, no, you have to do this, 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 and this. That's what a life is supposed to be. Special people can do, you know, other things or, yeah. or you know, people who are a little off or whatever could do other things, but you're doing this to protect yourself and your family. And they forget that artistic side of themselves. Yeah, look at, look at, it, it was his name, Kevin Potts? The guy that won American Idol? He was... What did he do? He was a, a, a like um, was he a truck driver or something? And he's this like the, or, um, um, opera. He was the mm. opera singer. Mm. His last name was Potts. And even the gal that won. It's like people, these artists that ha that they, they're they're artists, but they're not getting. They can't make a living doing their art form, so they have to do other things. But it's. it's it's hard. It's challenging. How do you how do you express? It? You have to find an outlet. And, and you somehow have to, you have to also. It seems like connect the dots. Just like your like this movie connects the dots of every area of your life. Your your own search for mentorship is reflected in Lucy's search for mentorship. Yeah. And you know, mentorship being a, a key to to success for you and and for Lucy's journey to to finding her authentic self. And you know, also the idea that. She was. She's an artist in the beginning, but still needs to figure out how to bring out yeah. the authenticity to to get rid of the need to lie, which is what ha like which is what happens to all of us. We start to put on the masks early on, and and so we don't true. go on that. You said you went initially to Europe because, and when you got there, you realize it's like a passport to be somebody else. Yeah, and and sometimes you have to be somebody else, or in other words, you have to travel far, far away. Yeah. to find what's closest to you to find yeah. yourself. And That's it's not right. even a physical far, far away. You kind of described it almost as like an, uh, an emotional or a mental one. Or metaphorically. Yeah. Sometimes you have to do that. You sometimes have to divorce yourself from what's happening in order to find what's all been there the whole time. And, you know, it's interesting your attachment to Fellini as opposed to, let's say, other directors. You, you went in search of Fellini. You didn't go in search of, I don't know, Cassavetes or you it's, didn't go down the street to search for Spielberg. You, yeah. you were in search of, of Fellini. And I wonder if that's somewhat connected to your attraction to, to Bart and The Simpsons. And I'll explain how. So Fellini, of course, mm. had this whole neo-realistic period where it's this co com combination of surrealism but, but making a statement about the current moment. And I think that's what The Simpsons is about. <laughs> it's it's oh it's totally absurdist and surreal, and at the same time they're always commenting on what's happening right now. James, you're uh, that's such an interesting um, viewpoint. It really is, and I don't I haven't written anything yet for The Simpsons. Um, but, but your attraction though to the the obviously you were attracted to the show and then the character, and then of course The Simpsons is is defined by by Bart in large part, and yeah. and how you portray him is. There, there's the writing and there's the trail, but I don't think you can separate the two. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, I mean, you you look at, you're just talking about my life choices. You know, these decisions that I make, um, they seem to be, um, how do I say it? It, it? it all seems to be like, oh, yeah, uh, I'm just going to go do this. But there's actually some kind of a form to that madness, right? Yeah, you have... Uh, a beginning, not a, not an end, but you can see in the arc of yeah, your career, yeah. there's a beginning, middle, and end. There's kind of this initial part where you have all these different mentorships, including a virtual mentorship at the very least with Fellini. Uh, yeah. And then you have this middle period where you're searching. You've already had some successes. You're searching for your authentic self. And then from there, it's only a short while after you get back uh, from Italy, yeah. that you kind of stumble into the Tracy Ullman show, and it spins mm -hmm. off into the the Simpsons, and right. and again, it all seems like attached to your own 
belief in like these surreal connections between things. You know, like just now you were describing your your quest between looking for the sculptor and where what he what's happened to him since. Like yeah. connecting all these dots is is almost and finding meaning in them is a surreal way to bring it into the into the moment. And I feel like the movie does that. The Simpsons, your your portrayal of Bart does that. Maybe I'm maybe I'm stretching, but that's no, what it's I interesting. felt. Interesting. I'm I'm fascinated by your by your viewpoint. You know, um, I was just thinking as you said that the whole thing about the art guy it, to, to a little bit more on that to complete that cycle is that yeah. we went off on the journey. And then when I came back, I had some photographs of the trip and sent and, and sent her another letter and sent her photographs, and she saw those and. When she saw those, it she got a better idea of the um, the quality of the film that we did, and she wrote me back a little bit faster, you know. And then when we shot the film and got the thing in the can, and I actually got footage on it, then I sent her a little bit of the the, the trailer for it, and now it's like I've, I I I can't wait. I'm hoping to be able to go to London soon. So that I can actually meet them, I just think that would just complete the cycle. But I find it so interesting that, you know, it's like doors can get shut. You know, I, you know, at first writing, writing Fellini, no, 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 yes, you know. Um, when did you start writing this movie? Like, when was in, the first idea? When was the first time you had the idea? I want to make a movie out of that time. Yeah, it was in the eighties. Yeah, no, it was ninety. No, it was doing. Um, it was ninety. Uh, was doing a monologue. I put together a monologue to start working on a one-woman show. And I started doing that for a while, but then within a couple years, I got cast as Bart, I got married, I had two children, I was pulled off. And that wasn't so much, and then I, I, I wasn't in class anymore. I wanted to raise my kids, and it was just the class went too late for me, and any, anyway, I just decided not to be there anymore. But by 95, now my kids were like four four and five years old. Yeah, four and five years old. And I'm like, I got to do this one-woman show. So I was invited. No, it was, it was in 93. Uh, it was in 90. I think it was in 93. And um, I went to, I was invited to a party. And it was all artists. And they, it was called a netless party where it was like poets People could read poetry or do a song or do a monologue or do a dance, some art form that they'd never done before. So it was called netless. So if you do it and it flops, you know, you better, you, somehow you, 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 it's, it's like puts a little pressure there because you'd never done it before. I thought, okay, so I've got this monologue and I'd never done it in my class. I'm going to do it at this party. So I'd written this thing and I'm standing there and I would happen to be wearing a nun's I was wearing a nun's habit because I had this concept. I don't want to go too far off, but like it was like Sister Bertrill from the Flying Nun with the mm -hmm. wings in the head, yeah. and it was a little. It was there was some comedy in it, and I I said hi. I just wanted to say I'm going to do this monologue, but I'm looking for a writer because I'm not a writer, but I want to do a one woman show, and this is I've started, but I could use some help. And one guy came up to me at the end, Peter Chenis. And he introduced himself, and man, he's the president of my production company, Spotted Cow Entertainment. He's he became the editor of the book I wrote in 2000. Was my life as a ten year old boy? I did it as a one woman show. I took it on tour as a lecture. Had to get all the actors to sign off release forms. Got support from Fox. All this technical stuff that had to do. I've traveled and just just had so much fun, and we've done had so many fun and games. Together, I just adore this guy. And so this evolution, when we started writing Fellini in 95, we did it as a one-woman show. And um, So that's like yeah. that's 22 years in the making of this movie from first thought yeah. to, to today. We're, 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 we're taping this as the movie's going to be released tonight. And yeah, and so bizarre. It's like back then the, actor, the, the actors came to see it at the theater geo and Matt was there and some of the writers were there and they've seen me go through this evolution of doing Bart Simpson, doing this one woman show, getting pregnant, having a baby. Now my son is a father and I'm a grand, it's just, we've all, a lot of us have gotten married, gotten divorces, had children, the longevity of this family, if you will. So to have Mike Scully and Rob Lezeb 
Lezebnik, Carolyn O'Meany, you know, um, Mike Reese come to see the film, you know how touching that is? It's so, it's so validating. It makes me feel, it's, it's a great feeling what, having that support. What do you think contributed to the longevity of The Simpsons? What, I mean, no other TV show has lasted as long, I don't think. Jeff Westbrook, <laughs> he saw it too. Um, what's the longevity? Yeah, what, what, what's the key to success there? Well, I think just, I mean, the 165 citizens of Springfield, I think there's somebody <laughs> that you can relate to. If you can't relate to somebody in Springfield, you must be living in a, under a rock, right? But it's, it's, not just the, it's not just the relatability, but, but the team. Like what, what? Oh, man, it's just, no, it's the writers. The writers really put it there for us. And then that also in terms of directing it and that, that we do about four takes, you know, per scene when we go in to record it. And four takes, but you know, give them what's written there, and then if I'm inspired, I'll add a little, little Nancy improv there. I mean, to watch Dan uh, go off and do his thing as Homer is just incredible. You know, it's you have to, I have to bite my tongue and hold my mouth so I don't, you know, ruin his take. Mm. It's just watching a one man show when he gets to go off and do some of these longer, like almost monologues that that uh, Homer has. So it's so so clearly. Uh, everybody's doing it. Not only, oh, this is my paycheck, but also it's like an act of love. Like they love doing what they do, which is oh the, the commitment. Oh my God, we get paid a lot of money to do what we love to do. That's every artist's dream to be on a show that you love. I mean, I can't imagine what it'd be like doing something that even like that it would be an integrity. After a while, it can become a personal integrity issue. It would be challenging. But you keep doing it in the sense that, um, I mean, you keep doing the things you love. Like you made this movie. You didn't have to oh, make yeah. this movie. You didn't have it's to. one of my That's philosophies. Hard work. It's a successful action. Do what you love. Surround yourself with people that support what you're doing. Be a professional. You know, hitch your wagon to a to a, a mentor. You know, these yeah. are the kinds of things that it has to do with. That, that for anybody, been... for anybody, not just an artist, for anybody in right. life. Right, that's like a code for success. And mm-hmm. then not to mention uh, these other things you said for, before, which is like surprise yourself so you can surprise yeah, others. Yeah, carpe diem, right, exactly. And 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 just to mention, you're also trying to be get a license as a NASCAR racer? <laughs> like, 158.2 what the heck? miles an hour. That's my top speed. What's your top speed? 158.2. It was on a track. It was totally legal. My street... My street speed and my my Tesla is not quite that high, but <laughs> yeah, I got know, into triple digits. So <laughs> you know, I had a, a race car lesson once, and I got really scared, like going above a hundred. Well, where were you? Where were um, you driving it? Yeah, what you road? know, there's um, a, a track on uh, Monticello, New York. Uh, uh, it's the pretty largest, wide. Uh, yeah, it's it's actually the largest private uh, race track in the um, oh. either the East Coast or the country. I okay. forget. And I had a, a sitting next to me with his own wheel, and it was a nice car. Oh yeah. And sitting yeah. next to me, and with his own wheel, was some professional stock car. Yeah. Uh, no, no, it was. Uh, it's oh. actually like a seven hundred thousand dollar car. Like I was getting, I was going to write an article about this, so they kind of outfitted me with the best and. Uh, so you didn't have the Simpson strap in, or it was just no. a regular. <laughs> oh, James, you you daredevil, you. Yeah, no, but well, I call, going over a hundred, I was scared. Yeah, I get it. It's scary, and then you're you're you have to make these turns and yeah. You know. Oh, dude, yeah. I've never done a uh, I've never done a regular car on a racetrack. I've just done that on on the five freeway going north. You know, it's like yeah. taking the the grapevine over. It's it, you know at five in the morning. There's nobody out there. Right. Going north, they're all coming. So you get your south. practice of going fast. Yeah. Okay. I've done only only one time. She says. <laughs> Yeah. The police this way the police don't have to track you. <laughs> uh oh, Nancy's on the road again. Yeah, be aware. So 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 in search of Fellini, are you you're obviously you're happy with the final product? Uh, oh yeah. And then get, you know, the the review that we got with the New York Times. We're over the moon. Oh, was, I didn't even see that review. What did it oh, say? Man, let's it let's was, throw some some quotes from that in there. Yeah, it's yeah, we'll have to I don't I didn't memorize it, but it was pretty wow. I, I'm just wow. They really, I think that the you know the reviewer really understood it, like you did. I mean, you don't for your listeners if you you have back off on seeing this because you don't know who Fellini is, you've never heard of him. It doesn't matter. It to- I, mean, I should say right? it Do totally you, does not matter. Yeah. You don't need to know Fellini at all. I think maybe at a, a basic understanding that there's a surreal component, but it's still very much grounded in a real story. Yeah. And and you said yourself actually that with La Strada, uh, which inspired you the most, that that uh, 
is probably the most grounded of his movies in terms of having a beginning, middle, and end. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. Maybe, yeah. And this certainly, this In Search of Fellini, your movie certainly has a very, not, I don't want to say traditional, but it has a beginning, middle, and end. It's a real story. It's not like it doesn't go yeah. off into surreal, although there's components, but Yeah, it's like not like Satyricon or Hammercord or, yeah, that's a little bit more out there, you know? So... I highly recommend it. I'll tell you just briefly how I felt watching it. A, the movie made me cry, which is rare. Oh, <laughs> like, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And second, it really it is like almost you're, wa- you're watching a beautiful story, of course, which is entertaining, but then there's lessons to be learned about how do you find your authentic self? How do you find the artist inside of yourself? You know, it's 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 the either the pure arc of the hero is in this in this movie. So Whoa. so it's beautiful. Thank you so much. So I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> I uh, uh, I'm so glad you came on the podcast, Nancy Cartwright. Yeah, Bart from The Simpsons. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you. I we had a discussion in the beginning where I kind of, you know, more or less said if you were comfortable saying the voice of Bart. So I'm glad you were able to. I think people connect. Oh, okay, here's the voice of. Bart. Oh yeah. And then she goes off and does this extremely like creative, artistic, beautiful movie. <laughs> so it's interesting that people should know too that you can connect the dots all over your life and be artistic in many different endeavors. Yeah. So thank you so much. It's such a limited release though. I mean, right now it's only New York and Los Angeles, but we've got it's coming out in Michigan and Washington and like just check your local listings as this thing starts to un you know, starts to un unfold throughout the country. Yeah, and, and and look, movies I think have a longer lifespan now just because they have their run and then they also have the run on iTunes. That's right, you know, or it, Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, which so, would be great. Now, you, but you could automatically put it on iTunes, but then you wait and see who kind of buys the rights first or how does that yeah, work? Yeah, I think they're working out some kind of a thing night right now with a distribution for, um, for downloading. All right, yeah. well, good. Well, thanks again, Nancy, for oh, coming on the is, show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you're wonderful, James. Oh, thank you. Yeah. God, you're so, you know what I love about you? You can add this if you want. I just, I'll tell you, you just, it's a real conversation. So many interviews with people in your position just have a list of questions and it's your communication. It's like you you really listen to what I say. You acknowledge what I say. And you take what I say and you're not stuck because we went all over the place on this. And then we kind of wove back and picked it up and then went somewhere else. And it was very much like, like what the subject was. Well, it's because... I do view it as a conversation. I'm learning, and you're my mentor in this. Like so many things. You're you one said. of the best. I'm <laughs> telling you. I don't. I I've done probably a thousand interviews in the la- in all these years. I'm not kidding. Well, let's just say hundreds. I've done hundreds and hundreds of them. It's a handful. I'm not kidding. Of an individual that does his homework and really knows how to have a conversation, and it's it, and I I really respect you for it because uh, like Johnny I Carson, you that. the best. I really appreciate you saying that. And, I, and there's so many things from this conversation I'm going to take into my own life. Like you mentioned how um, Mary Lynn Rice Cub would go to the comedy store in Cleveland yeah. and perform because that was her commitment to it. So I've been, just like when you start learning new things, I've been, um, I wanted to learn stand up. So it's about six months ago. Oh my God, that's start- right. I started going four times a week on stage. I don't even think people know how much I go up. Like I go up, I went up the last two nights. I'm going up tomorrow night. Oh my God. So, oh my God. I. How's it going? It's going great. And and it's amazing how much, how difficult, like I'm funny in general, but to translate that into stand up in front of an audience. And I do a lot of public speaking, but yeah. to also translate that into stand up, there's so many skills you need to learn. And and muscles you need to exercise. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like I had last night, two nights ago it went great. Like I totally killed. I took the same set last night and I had a heckler. And learning how to deal with that is yeah, very difficult. Yeah. Because you can't you can't really throw the rope. You can't you can't really get into it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and no, well you have to you have to But somehow you gotta shut him up. Yeah, and and he was right in front of me and the person right in front of you basically controls the audience mm. you know because if he sh- if everybody they're looking at me but they're seeing him shake his head they're not going to laugh so there's like mm. so i had to kind of figure out on the fly what was his problem <laughs> and you know 
so I, I engaged him a little bit without insulting him. I didn't want to do that. And uh, it's just very complicated. I wonder what would happen. Um, I wonder what would happen if you, it, or if, if you would have leaned down and said, what's your name? It's, it, I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, is he inebriated? Is he high? No, is he, he wasn't at all. And I, I, I had a, a later on, what, I saw him doing his thing and I had a later on joke of, um, um, I tend to fall in love at first sight, like very quickly. And I asked him directly, do you, and his girlfriend mm. was there, do you fall in love at first sight? And he kept shaking his head. And his girlfriend started laughing like, no, no, he's just upset because you called your daughter a whore. <laughs> and in an earlier oh, joke. Oh. And, I, and I said to him, you, you know, and we're in the middle of the thing. And I said to him, um, you know, we're in a comedy club. So they were, this should be the one place that it's safe to call anybody anything. Yeah. And, Don't and, take it personal, dude. Yeah, and, and he was like, and he actually said, not in this context. And I'm like, okay. And then right there on the stage, I got a phone call and I forgot to turn off my ringer. So like you, I decided to just be in the moment. I answered the phone on the stage and I said, listen, I gotta go, I'm on the stage, but tell your mother she's a whore. And uh, oh, oh, so then, oh, oh, then oh, everybody started see? laughing. It's funny, I think yeah. because it's so inappropriate. Yeah. I think Totally did the right thing. I... For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Before you go, I wanted to just say thank you to everyone who has rated and reviewed this podcast on iTunes. Thank you for listening. Stan, thanks for that review. Bernardo, thanks for that review. Anna Scheinman, Andrew Roan, the Unicorn Queen, Soul Surf Recovery, and every other person out there who is listening and sharing. I really, really can't thank you enough for your ongoing support and reviews. Thanks. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.